Well, my name is Brian Bird, and my rank was flight sergeant when I finished in the war. I joined up in, I think it was March 1943, and in those days, the Air Crew Receiving Centre was at Lord's Cricket Ground. And I marched into Lord's Cricket Ground with my little bag to put my clothes in to send home to mother. And I admired the green grass of Lord's Cricket Ground I'd never seen before, and I was quite absorbed with that when a horrid loud voice from the other side shouted, get out of that bloody civilian coma. And I nearly went, turned on my heels and went home to mother, but I didn't. I obviously thought about my future and I joined up there and eventually was sent up uh, to Scarborough, where there was an ITW, an initial training wing, which was one of the, it was known as the queen of the ITWs because of its discipline. And I spent 12 weeks there uh, doing a lot of square bashing and a lot of navigation, meteorology, uh, airmanship, aerodynamics, you name it, we covered the whole subject. Can I just ask, just going back a bit, how old were you when you were in 43 and what made you want to join the RAF? What was, your, what was going on then? Well, it's a, 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 a strange answer because as a, as a small boy, when my father was alive, he was a doctor and a surgeon and we had a big house in Faversham and I, as a small boy, used to play in the garden. And it was in the days when there were the big airliners uh, which flew over towards Croydon. Now, the, the, uh, the, the um, liners used to fly over and one day my mother was looking out of the bedroom window and one of these planes came over and I saw it and I ran indoors screaming and she thought well that's the end of that future for him he doesn't obviously like flying but I think when I left school I was away at boarding school I started to feel the urge to do something in the services worthwhile and air came to my mind and that's what really spurred me on. I, there wasn't any other fundamental reason for me joining the Air Force, I just did it. Where do you want to pick up from there? Well, uh, you, you, you pass a test at Scarborough, you're either selected as a pilot or a, a pupil pilot, or you're sent off to a place like Blackpool as an air gunner, an air gunner trainee. And I was fortunate enough to pass my exam and I was selected for fly, uh, to, as a pilot for training. And I was posted down to a place called Cywell in Northampton, a little air, airport there that's still there to this day. And it was there that I learned to fly Tiger Moths. And I did eight hours in the front cockpit with my uh, instructor in the back cockpit. And one day <coughs> uh, he stopped the aircraft <coughs> after we'd landed and got out and came to me in the front cockpit and said, you've got her, do your first solo. And I've never forgotten that to my 60, 70 years ago, I did the squarest circuit I've ever done in my life, including operational flying. And I can see the water tower that I turned around, came down, made a, a, a good landing and unfortunately spoiled the thrill of the whole thing because you, whether you know it, but the tiger moth has a skid at the back, not a wheel. And it's very difficult to turn a tiger moth unless you open the throttle and, and get a lot of air flowing over the, the tail. And I was afraid to do that as a sprog pilot. I didn't want to spoil the day by turning my aircraft upside down. So the poor instructor had to walk all the way across the aerodrome to take me back to my base but he was very good and he accepted that I was uh, wise not to put the throttle on too much. And I, I glowed with pleasure at having flown solo in eight hours. And there is a, a, a sequel to that. I took my flying book to Church Fenton when I was 75. And the young airman of today looked at it and said, did you go solo in eight hours? My God, it took us 25 hours. And I was very thrilled with that. And uh, so that took me then to Manchester, to a famous place called Heaton Park. 
uh, which was a transit camp. And I didn't know whether I was going <coughs> to Canada or to South Africa or wherever it was. And a lot of my friends went to Canada and I was left behind. And then my name came up and I was issued with tropical kit. And I thought, well, this must be South Africa. But let's be careful. It may be, it may be a feint that they're trying to uh, suggest that I'm going to South Africa and I'll go to Canada and they'll take the, uh, the uh, kit off me when I get there. But it was South Africa. And I went on to a ship in uh, Liverpool and we went out into the Atlantic and uh, I thought we were still going to Canada when the ship was still going east. And uh, eventually um, they turned around and it went through Gibraltar. Unfortunately, as far as I was and other people were concerned, it went through Gibraltar at uh, sunset. And if you realize that, uh, and I said it was going west, east, it's going west. When you realize the sun sets in the west, all the silhouette of the convoy was lit up by the sunset. And of course, Morocco was stiff with German spies. And lo and behold, about a day later, we were attacked by Stukas, a German Stuka dive bombed, and we all had to go below decks and the smell of cordite lives with me to this day. But we were fortunate, we weren't hit. There were three ships that were hit and they, two of them sank and one went into, in, onto the um, North African coast. But the rest, uh, the next day, the captain of the ship put the radio on and he said, there is Lord Hawhaw's program from Germany Germany calling, Germany calling, and he went on to say that the convoy that they had attacked in the Mediterranean, they'd sunk 30 ships. What he didn't say, what he didn't realise was that half our ships went off to, to Malta and our remaining few went on to, to Suez and there I changed ships. <laughs>